Today, I am going to show you how to use my, i.e. your, home sewing machine. They have enough similarities, and you are a smart enough cookie that I bet we can, with our powers combined, get your sewing machine out of the closet and start using it. Let's get started. We're gonna begin with everyone's favorite, the anatomy of the machine. So back up to begin with, why am I showing you my home sewing machine and pretending that you will be able to learn what you need to know about yours? Because these machines have been made quite similarly for a very long time. So even though there's gonna be minute differences, you will be able to watch me go through the functions here and troubleshoot a couple of things and figure out how this applies to your machine. I know that not just because I've owned over 20 machines over the last two decades, but also because my original Kenmore, maybe we'll get a shot of that, has some of the same functions that this three-year-old brother does. So, some stitch functions. These little guys here have very similar stitch functions, machine to machine. These options that you're seeing, maybe they're up here on the top of your machine, maybe they're down here if you have a computerized machine, but the pictures themselves, the little diagrams themselves, those guys, I will bet you anything that you have, if not all, at least most of those similar functions on your machine. Next, we'll jump up top here to the threading. We'll go through actual threading of the machine, but let's look at a couple of the pieces first. Up here, we've got our spool holder. So let's take a look at this. You've either got a horizontal one like I do where it slides on, or yours might sit all the way upright. Mine doesn't go upright, but that's okay. And yours may sit up here like this. Either is fine, both of them work. That is where your spool is going to sit. And then, over here and here, we have bobbin winders. So this itself is the bobbin winder, and usually they will pop over to the side in position when you're ready to wind. So there's two threading scenarios for you. One is bringing the thread over here to wind your bobbin, or the other is, of course, actually threading the machine. So we'll go through both of those, but to begin, mine is gonna have the first and second, same steps as my threading. Okay, and to get it set here, we're gonna go around that tension spoke, let's call it, and then under that tension disc. Now, you'll notice off to the right, right there, look at that, it has a diagram for me. I will bet that yours does too. I want you to notice something too. Let's back up for one moment. Do you see these little numbers? Do you see how one is outlined in black? One, two, and then we jump over here and all of a sudden we have three and four. Imagine that, they are giving us a diagram. Anymore, they're putting these diagrams directly on your machine. So even if you threw away the manual or you inherited this machine from someone else, I guarantee you there is a shadow of a diagram somewhere on this machine for these two threading functions the bobbin, and the needle itself. You can figure this out. You know why else? Because the internet. I'm also going to link one of my favorite resources, which is, I think it's called manuallib.com. And it's literally a library of all the manuals of every machine. I have found obscure manuals on this thing. So I'm gonna link that later too, just in case you are really a manual person and you really wanna see it and don't feel like Googling it, we can do that also. Back to our bobbin winding. Once we go through and we follow the four steps on this diagram, all we need to do now is place a bobbin on here and slide our thread around it and push into position. You are now ready to wind your bobbin. And again, I have seen so few machines that don't use almost this exact setup that I am confident you have the ability to do this. Um, one thing here, sometimes people confuse, let me see if I can point to this with a different color. Do you see that little wiry thing there? That just has to do with tension for holding the bobbin on. So 
I'm going to place a bobbin on there so that you can see it. That is really just for holding tension on the bobbin in place so that the bobbin doesn't start to <laughs> pop up just like that as it's winding. This has nothing to do with thread. Do not put your thread through there. Okay, you're smarter than that. All right, next. Now, oh, that's a little cutie. Now, we're gonna finish the anatomy before we go on to the threading. A couple of other functions that many machines have, especially in computerized machines, I don't even wanna call them, quote, newer machines because these types of functions, they've been on machines for 20, 30 years. There's good news and bad news. The sewing industry has not evolved a ton is the bad news. The good news is it means that the machine similarities are still very, very easy to understand and they don't update them frequently, which means once you learn it, once you learn to ride this bike, you can ride any bike in my opinion. So next we've got speed. Most people are gonna have a speed function here. It's usually, it usually looks like a little play button and fast forward button. I of course have mine pushed all the way up because I'm a psycho and can't sew slow for any reason. And then these couple of ones are a lot of fun. I actually have a little cutting option on this machine just for convenience. And that means a little snipper shoots across the bottom here and cuts my threads before I pull it out, which if you see that as an option, it's not that much more. Pay for it, do it. Not having to pull it out and snip the threads every time, let me tell you something, you will sew 10 times as much. Oh my gosh, such a game changer. Next, we have needle position. So that one, as you can see, is up or down. You know, sometimes when you get to the end of a, a line of stitching, you want the needle in a certain position, or maybe you're lifting to turn a corner. Every machine is gonna have an option like that. And then we've got our reverse. And you can tell because it literally looks like, oop, we're turning around. So needle position and reverse, definitely gonna be similar. And then for me, I've got this little red, it's not even a button actually, it's just a um, indicator for when it's ready to sew and not. Let me put my presser foot down. See how it turned green? That's just a little note telling me, hey, your presser foot is up. Do not sew. Your presser foot's down. Now you can sew. Great, awesome. Last thing that I wanna show you that is not really, um, it's not important what's in here. It's just important that you know that it's here is that you probably have a drawer like this. Now, yours probably either opens or, hold on, slides off. Uh, that's the two most common ways. Mine actually does both. So you can slide the whole thing off, giving you actually a little bit of a free arm here, which is good for pant hems and sleeves and smaller cylindrical pieces of your garments or projects. Or just opening here because I need to get one of these feet out. And most machines will come with a couple of feet. Let's not worry about the feet though. That is not what I wanna emphasize in showing you all of this. What I wanna emphasize is that you are capable of using your machine no matter what it is. So watch, watch and think and apply this because your superpower is out there and you can do it. So next, anatomy. Done, threading, next. Again, you may have slightly different steps, but all of them are relatively simple. And again, I believe wholeheartedly that there's some sort of diagram that's gonna guide you in this direction, but the anatomy and the construction, internal construction of most machines, I swear to you, is relatively similar over the years. We got our little tail of our thread here. I'm gonna put this cap end on my thread spool because I wanna hold that in place. Otherwise it has a tendency to slide off. Admittedly, the horizontal bar is not my favorite. I actually do like the vertical post a little bit better, but you know what is what it is. This makes it compact. That's why they do it, but it doesn't matter. Next up, we are just gonna follow this happy little trail that has been laid out for me. So now we are switching over 
if you've got the, this variation from the bobbin winding to the regular threading diagram, mine is this regular uh, one with no outline around it. Down below this and then up again, and now you're going sliding back through this trough. So really, all of this, everything that you see that are these troughs, got my number three there, three, up, number four, actually stop right here. I'm gonna turn my hand wheel and show you what's there. Oh, dang it, you can't see it on mine. All right, this particular piece of plastic is hiding a metal loop that this is looping around. And I think you'll hear a little bit of a click there as it slides in, down to step five. And now look all the way under the machine there, little hook there that I'm sliding the thread behind. This is more of a guide. It's really guiding the thread in place. And now we're finally ready to actually thread the needle. And we're gonna go front to back in most cases, but you will know most home sewing machines are front to back. I'm not actually gonna do it, but then you see there, you can see the hole, that is it. Like I said, I think that this is semi-universal within reason. However, I will admit to you now, because you've gotten this far into the video, that I'm a big brother fan. This is a brother. A lot of my machines are brothers and really like them. But if you have something else, Singer, Bernina, Husqvarna, Babylock, I want to know. Tell me the differences. Tell me what's different. Tell me what you like. Tell me what you don't like. I want comments on this one because it's really hard to find this information out unless you make the full investment and actually buy a machine. So help me out. Help everyone else out. Make comments and tell us the differences. Okay. Bobbin setup does differ. So I've got a drop in versus a front load. Now it sounds like we're talking about washing machines. You, If you have a front load or a separate bobbin case, this is going to be a little bit different for you. And I will show you one of the metal bobbin cases from actually my industrial machines, which load that way upright as well. But for me, I've got this drop-in style and I actually have a cute little window here and everything. This is my drop-in style bobbin. So I've got a clear window, which I love, by the way. I would recommend that as a feature because you can start to see if you're getting thread nesting up in there. Uh, okay, so remove my little window, which is a little lever on the side for me. And then the bobbin literally, like it sounds, drops right in. So if you can barely see right there, I even have a little diagram printed on this section of the uh, throat plate that shows me that I wanna drop this right in here. And then normally you've got a little cutter there. Eat, mine is kind of old, so <laughs> I'm gonna just pull it like that. But this is a drop-in style. Now, I really like this. I like that it's easy to control, and I like, again, that I can see it through there. However, functionally, it's not better or worse than the alternative. The alternative being that you have likely a side or front loader where the bobbin is inside of a bobbin case and it is vertical. So it's sitting either way, this way or this way. Again, functionally doesn't matter. It just matters that you're loading it correctly so that it works. So. I don't think there's necessarily one benefit over the other, though I will tell you this. If you are looking for a new machine, you're learning to new, use a new machine, or maybe you're buying one for someone, I do like the drop-in. I find it to be more approachable. It's easier to see everything. And so for a beginner, that's gonna be my preference, but only because of mainly aesthetic not because of function. They're both great, they're both super functional. Next order of business, you probably noticed that my bobbin is plastic, and this one that I'm showing you is metal. I heard the most interesting thing when I was picking up some bobbins 
in the Bob and Al. At Joanne's the other day, I heard this husband who had gotten dragged along <laughs> to the Joanne's with his wife. And he was like, she's, she's looking at the bobbins. And he was like, well, <laughs> why would you buy plastic when you can buy metal? The metal are so much stronger. And I was like, <laughs> well, <laughs> because if her machine isn't made for metal bobbins and she puts a metal one in there, it'll just screw it up. What I mean to say is, do not just buy whatever looks better or looks stronger. Your machine needs a specific type of bobbin and it is one or the other. It is not both. They are not interchangeable and you do have to figure out which one it is. This one is really critical. It has everything to do with whether or not the machine will work properly, the tension will be proper, and this little bobbin itself will actually fit in there and do what it's supposed to do. So there are only two which is great, meaning to say there are only two materials, plastic or metal. They do come in different sizes. And again, the manual will tell you which one, but also Google will. And also literally just typing your machine into any search engine probably will. So this is a really important one. Go with the one that you are supposed to use versus just using the metal because they're strong. I get the draw, but that's not the point. We gotta give it what it wants. Next, let's talk about everyone's favorite topic, tension. So I wanna start this with a disclaimer. Before you think that it's a tension issue, have you threaded your needle, the upper part of the machine correctly? Have you used the correct bobbin and threaded the bobbin correctly. Did you wind the bobbin with nice, good, smooth tension? As in, there's not a bunch of like knots and sort of tangled up thread on that bobbin because maybe it's old and maybe you did something weird like wind it by hand. I don't know, doesn't matter. The tension on the spool itself, the tension on the bobbin, itself, the seating, like the, the way the thread is seated in all of the places that it's supposed to go, top and bottom. And finally, have you replaced your needle recently? Tell me, be honest. Do you know how many hours that needle can sew before it's technically getting dull or burred or it's ready to go? Six sewing hours. I know. No one talks about it. But we change the needles in our machines at least every week, sometimes every day. I'm sorry, but that one is not just a marketing ploy. That's a real one. Six hours of sewing, meaning six functional hours, and you need a new needle. Needles are not expensive. So do it. Change it. Now, after you've gone through that list, now we can actually talk about tension. So... There are tension points all throughout the machine. Every time you're looping under a metal bar or through a trough, those are all tension points that are allowing essentially the pulley system of the sewing machine to work properly against its different friction points. Okay. But you do have a tension dial. Most of us are gonna only have one tension dial on the machine, and as you can see, Mine is at a very friendly and neutral three. Honestly, I never change it. Like, ever. I know there will be comments about this, but I don't do it. The reason is this. Your machine is made for light to heavy material, likely. Unless it's called a heavy duty machine, it's probably not meant for heavier, heavier denim and up like leather, for instance. So know that about your machine. Assume that if you just bought a nice looking domestic machine, it's probably for light to medium fabrics only. And if that is the case, most of the time, I am gonna leave my tension there. Because, you know what? Do you know what tension is? I think this is a whiteboard situation. Let's go do that. <sighs> tension. Tension, tension, tension. 
Everyone hates it. But you know what? Gets a bad rap because once it's right, it makes all the difference in the world and it really doesn't need that much fussing with. Not, a, not as much as people build it up to need. So you've got your spool up here and it's threaded and it comes down and it comes down to your needle. Okay. And then you've got your little bobbin down here and its little thread is coming up there. Okay. That's the machine. Now, what's happening is this. Each time the needle goes down, it's making a loop like this. Okay. Doop, doop, doop. Each time it, the needle is collecting up that bobbin thread. Do, do, do like this. Okay. So collapse that. It's obviously not that exaggerated. It's like this. Do, do, do. But do you see this little area right here? The connection point is governed by the tension. Okay. So that means we want the top thread to come down and the bottom thread to come up and for them to meet lovingly and peaceably right in the center. And we want an even amount dipped down from the top and up from the bottom. So when your tension is off, it's because let's say the needle thread is too loose and the bobbin thread is coming right through like that. And so you're getting loops on the underside. That means either your top is too loose or your bottom is too tight. Vice versa, your upper thread is too tight and or your bottom thread is too loose. That's when you're seeing loops on the upper side, okay? There are probably way better diagrams than this, but explanation is the same. Your goal with tension is to get the upper thread the upper thread and the lower thread, spool and bobbin, to meet together right in the center of your fabric, meaning you don't see loops on either side because they're interlocking. They are lock stitching, lock stitch machine. You get where I'm going with this? Right in the middle of the fabric, invisible to you, but meeting right in the center there. Okay? I'm really glad we talked about this. Whew. Boy, if I had a dollar for every time I explain that. So I'm glad you're here and learning with me. You know, tension is such an interesting one because there are so many things that can go wrong to make the sewing bad. But tension is one of those things, it's like your teeth. When your teeth don't hurt and they're working, you just ignore them. You totally take them for granted and it's awesome. When your tooth hurts, it's everything. You can't stop thinking about it. You can't eat, you can't breathe, everything's awful. That's tension. So get it right, and then we'll move on to everything else. And it's perfect. Okay. So we've got our tension great in a great place. That's awesome. If you are searching for a machine, these are the things that I love and genuinely think make a huge difference. So this is your presser foot. These are your feed dogs down there. Your presser foot exerts pressure, presser, pressure, okay, when it's down. I love to be able to adjust that. And for me, and for a lot of machines, the knob that adjusts that is back here. This knob, as I increase in numbers, is increasing the pressure of the presser foot. So you've got your fabric, literally, and your presser foot is moving along it as it's sewing. I like to be able to increase or decrease the amount of pressure that the presser foot is exerting. I think it's the biggest deal because this is where you get more variation and flexibility of the types of fabrics that you can sew on your machine. This is one of, to me, the number one ways that you can make successful sewing broaden across a stretchy fabric to a thicker wool fabric and everything in between. 
in addition to that, the other most important thing is the feed dogs pushing up against that presser foot. <laughs> pressure, presser. So this is exerting pressure and these guys down there, you see those teeth? Those are my feed dogs. And they are coming up and exerting pressure as well. So if you have the option to buy a machine that will give you either or both of these functions, do it. Because being able to change the, I don't want to call it differential and confuse you, but Essentially, it is the differential. It's changing how much pressure gets exerted. That, that is your biggest freedom in types of fabrics that you want to sew, especially if you really want to get into stretch. And I definitely suggest that. That's awesome. Now, the last thing is, again, something that's a little bit harder to find, but to me, makes all the difference in the world. Have you ever seen this? Do you know what this is? This is, uh, there's a lot of names for it. Thigh bar, uh, knee press, I don't know. It doesn't matter, you're moving it with your leg, okay? If your machine or the machine that you're looking at has this little guy, and um, traditionally, almost always, it's gonna be on the right-hand side, that means that you have, uh, I'm gonna scoot this close to the edge of the table here, you have an attachment for this. And it literally just slides in like that. And now I'm gonna lower my presser foot and watch this. Why does this matter? Because it means that I'm using both of my hands to sew while I'm able to move the presser foot up and down. That is as baller as it gets. Baller, this makes all the difference to me in the world. When I upgraded finally from using this, I started the business with this machine, this actual one that you're looking at. Uh, and I still have it because it's still great. When I started and I was looking at, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna upgrade? What industrial features do I need? Being able to lift without my hands, so, in the industrials, we actually have it in the pedal. So the pedal has an automatic hydraulic lift. This is just a regular guy down here. Um, but this is a great alternative, great home alternative to that. Being able to lift that without hands and having an automatic cutter. We also have an automatic cutter, again, all in the pedal on the industrials, but as a function up here on this machine, these two functions are common enough that I think that you can find them. And to me, they make the biggest difference in addition to that presser foot pressure adjuster. Pressure foot, I knew I was gonna do it. Presser foot pressure, automatic cutter option, and a hands-free presser foot lifter. If I was gonna suggest any functions, it would be those. Which brings us to all the things I don't care about. Everybody wants to know what I love about machines, which is basically everything. But I do think that the things that I don't care about are important. It's not that I don't like them. It's just that I want you to have like a really good, clear vision of what actually matters when you're going out there trying to find a machine or even just thinking about the one that you have. What's gonna make you sell more? The things that I don't care about, I don't care how many stitch functions it has. Straight stitch, stitch length adjustment, small or big, stitch width. I want a zigzag. I want to have a zigzag option. And that's it for me. I don't care about anything else. We sew everything under the sun in the shop and the industrials don't have a zigzag. The reason I don't want you to get something with a ton of different functions is because if you are feeling overwhelmed or intimidated by the machine at all, you aren't going to use it. And the point is to use it. You have the ability to learn to use any machine. So 
keep it simple, keep it easy for your sake because you deserve it. Spend more time learning how it feels, how it sounds, how it moves, and less time trying to figure out all of the really cool but not totally crucial to sewing 50 different embroidery stitches and USB cord that you can plug into your laptop to load all of those really cool Sweetie Bird cartoon embroidery stitches on. You don't need that. You just need you and a machine with a couple of good functions. So focus on the internal working and what you want it for. Do you wanna make curtains? Do you wanna make clothes? Spend more time on the patterns and the fabric and all of that stuff and just let that machine work for you. Don't get something that you're gonna put away and never get out because God, I'll have to learn to use it and that's gonna be so hard and I have too many other things on my plate right now because you're right, you're busy. And this should be the easy thing. This should be the fun thing. So. For my recommendations, I've already admitted that I have some brand preferences, but for the rest of my recommendations, look at the description below, and we've got some articles and stuff linked in there that is super good reading, and you'll love it. And other than that, I would like some comments. Um, positive, opposing, anything on a bunch of the things that I've said here and I want you to tell me what I missed, what I haven't told you, and we'll do another one of these if you want. Thanks so much. Like, subscribe, all the things. See you next time.